Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So we will continue our discussion on the different ion channels that are present in the body and in the last module we discussed this uh, simple tabular column which shows the different ion channels on uh, one axis as well as showing the different ways in which they are gated on the other axis. So this axis shows their selectivity and this axis shows their gating. In the last module we have also covered the important ion channels that are required for the neuronal action potential. We talked about the voltage gated sodium channels, we talked about the delayed rectifier potassium channels and we also talked about the leak potassium channels which constitute the, uh, which help in maintaining the resting membrane potential. Now we will study the next set of ion channels and we will begin by looking at the inward rectifier ion channels. We have already discussed a little bit as to what a rectifier is. We said that rectification means that the conductance in one particular direction is more than the conductance in the other direction. So this is an example of a graph of an inward rectifier where inward currents uh, are shown here which are much larger than the outward currents. Now, it may not be that a current is a pure rectifier. So in this example, the current passes, the channel passes inward currents, but does not pass any currents at all in the outward direction. But in uh, the cell, that may not be the case. So they may, the channel may pass inward currents at a much larger rate as compared to the outward currents that it passes through. So now let's discuss the different inward rectifier channels that are seen commonly in the body. And we're talking about inward rectifier potassium channels. These are primarily two channels. One is the K-ATP channel, which is shown in red. The second is the K-potassium acetylcholine channel, which is shown, or the K-ACH channel, which is shown in here. You will see that the K-ATP channel is shown as a ligand gated channel by an intracellular ligand. It's also shown as one of the channels that are constitutively open at the RMP. So the KATP channel is a constitutively open channel and is also an intracellularly gated uh, ligand gated channel. Whereas the acetylcholine potassium channel or the KACH channel is a ligand gated channel that is gated by an extracellular ligand. Now let's look a little bit more about these channels in detail. So an inward rectifier potassium channel, as we said, is open at the RMP. It permits an inward current due to potassium entry at hyperpolarizing voltages. So there's potassium entry, which causes uh, an inward current at a hyperpolarizing voltage. It can pass a positive current or due to potassium exit, but the magnitude of this positive current is much less than the inward current and therefore it is called a rectifier. Examples, as we said, are the KATP channels and the KACH channels. And the current voltage profile of such a channel would be something similar to what I've shown you before, where you have an inward current at hyperpolarizing voltages, and they may be able to pass a small outward current at depolarizing voltages. A little bit about the KATP channel. It is closed by intracellular ATP. So ATP closes these channels. It's selective for K+. plus. Where do we see these channels? You will come across these channels when you discuss the pancreatic beta cell. So this is present in the pancreatic beta cells as well as in the inner mitochondrial membrane. What is its function? This channel is important for insulin secretion in the beta cell and it helps link beta cell secretion to external glucose. Common drugs, sulfonylureas, which are used for diabetes, block these channels. So when we come to uh, insulin secretion, you will realize that glucose passes into the cell, is metabolized to form ATP and ATP then blocks the KATP channel and this is how secretion in the beta cell is actually linked 
to glucose. So this is the KATP channel in the pancreatic beta cell. The KACH channel, this is present in the pacemaker cells of the heart. It's selective for potassium once again. And this is how acetylcholine acts via the M2 muscarinic receptors. So acetylcholine acting via the M2 muscarinic receptors activates a G protein. And this makes depolarization of the heart more difficult and therefore it slows down the heart rate. So acetylcholine slowing down the heart rate is because of its action on M2 muscarinic receptors which act via a G protein on the KACH channel therefore slowing down the heart. So with this we have covered the inward rectifiers, the KACH channel and the KATP channel. There is one more group of channels, uh, potassium channels that we need to talk about and that is the calcium activated potassium channels or uh, which are ligand gated channels but are gated by an intracellular ligand and this ligand here is calcium. So these are calcium activated potassium channels. These are sensitive to calcium, they are selective for potassium and when the cytosolic calcium or when these, the levels of calcium inside the cell rise, then these channels open. So these channels open when intracellular calcium rises. Some of them are also voltage gated. So they will open with depolarization, but they also increase their conductance or they open when the intracellular calcium comes up. There are three types that are discussed, a small conductance, an intermediate conductance and a large conductance. So the short forms are BK for a big conductance or a large conductance, IK for an intermediate conductance and SK for the small conductance. So calcium activated potassium channels are potassium channels selective for potassium but they open with a rise in intracellular calcium. Some of them also open with a depolarization. Now with this we have completed most of the potassium channels that we come across. We have talked about leak potassium channels, voltage gated or delayed rectifier potassium channels. We have talked about inward rectifier potassium channels, ligand gated both by intracellular as well as extracellular ligands and we have talked about the calcium activated potassium channels. When we look at the sodium channels that we have studied, we have studied the voltage gated sodium channel. And we have seen how this voltage gated sodium channel is important in the depolarization of the action potential. There is one more sodium channel that we should discuss and that is something called the epithelial sodium channel or the ENAC as it is commonly called by its short form. This is a constitutively open sodium channel and let us see a little bit more about it. Where do we see this? We see this channel in the kidneys. More specifically, we see these in the distal renal tubule and in the intestine. And the job of this channel is to help the body reabsorb absorbing or reabsorbing sodium. Now, this is the site of the act of action of the hormone aldosterone, which acts on these uh, channels and actually increases the number of epithelial sodium channels in the kidneys. So aldosterone action on the kidneys in the distal renal tubule increases the number of ENACs that are there on the, uh, on the luminal side of the membrane, thereby reabsorbing a large amount of uh, sodium. This is also the site of action of the uh, diuretic amyloride. So amyloride blocks this ENAC channel, therefore preventing sodium absorption and causing diuresis. So with this we have covered the common sodium channels that is the epithelial sodium channel as well as the uh, voltage gated sodium channels. There are numerous calcium channels that are present on the cell and uh, if we look at the different calcium channels we will find that you have voltage gated calcium channels, calcium channels that are constitutively open, calcium channels that open with uh, ligands as well as others such as the store operated calcium channels. We will talk a little bit about each one of them. Before we go in and discuss uh, more about the calcium channels, let us have a quick look at what is the importance of intracellular calcium and also what are the levels of calcium in the body. Let us start off with the levels of calcium. So if you look at what are the levels of calcium in the blood, it's important to know that calcium in the blood 
exists in two forms. It exists in a free form as well as in the bound form. So about half the calcium that's in the blood is bound and the free calcium is only about half of it. So the calcium levels in the blood are about 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter or we will be discussing this in millimoles per liter. So it's 2.2 2 to 2.6 and only about half of it that's about 1.2 is available as the free form. For all our future calculations, we will be referring to external calcium as one millimolar, which is convenient for all our future calculations. Now, we know that this calcium is very regulated. There are hormones like uh, vitamin D, parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, which regulate the uh, calcium levels. And when we look at the internal levels of calcium, we find that the outside is 1 millimolar, whereas the inside is 100 nanomolar. So 10,000 times difference of calcium from the outside to the inside. Now, with such a large concentration gradient for calcium, one could ask the question, does this concentration gradient contribute to the resting membrane potential? And in the discussions on the resting membrane potential, you will realize that usually in a neuron, this is not the case because there is no resting permeability for the cell to calcium. Now, what is the importance of intracellular calcium? Why are we so concerned about the levels of intracellular calcium? You will come across two major physiological processes that are highly regulated or controlled or triggered by the intracellular calcium. And they are exocytosis and muscular contraction. So let's first look at the first one that is exocytosis. We know that exocytosis is when a vesicle from the inside of the cell fuses with the membrane, thereby emptying out all its contents. This is a type of membrane transport. And this exocytosis in most places is linked to the levels of intracellular calcium. So when the intracellular calcium rises, there is an exocytosis or intracellular calcium is sometimes the last link or uh, for exocytosis. We commonly come across exocytosis in... Um, the neuromuscular junction in the synapse and also in most cells where there is active secretion such as hormone secretion. So the first important use of intracellular calcium is for triggering or increasing exocytosis. The second major reason why intracellular calcium is highly regulated is in the muscle cell where we when we discuss excitation contraction coupling, we realize that when the intracellular calcium rises, there is muscular contraction. And when the intracellular calcium level falls, it's possible for the muscle to relax. So we've talked about two important reasons why intracellular calcium has to be regulated. So how is this intracellular calcium regulated? We could regulate either the calcium entry into the cell or we could regulate the calcium storage. Some cells are able to store calcium within the cell, say in the sarcoplasmic reticulum in muscle, muscle cells, and from this store, calcium could either come to the cytoplasm or move away back to the store. And also the calcium exit, maybe the way calcium is pumped out uh, of the cell or maybe pumped back into the store. That's the third way in which calcium can be regulated. This will be discussed in more detail when we talk about calcium regulation within the cell. But what we will discuss now is the different channels that are involved in regulating intracellular calcium levels. And we'll start off with the first one, that is the voltage-gated calcium channels. We've discussed this in brief before, but we'll talk about the L-type calcium channel and the T-type calcium channel, which are voltage-gated channels selective for calcium. Let's start off with the voltage-gated calcium channels. So what do we know about them? We know that these are ga the gating, these are open with depolarization, they are selective for calcium. There are two types that are described. One is the L-type calcium channel, L for a long-lasting or a longer effect that it has, and the T-type calcium channel, which is a transient channel, or its effect is only transient, its opening is transient. So this L-type calcium channel is present on the cardiac muscle cells, the pacemaker cells, it's present in the axonal nerve endings and also present in vascular smooth muscle. Whereas the T-type calcium channel is primarily seen in the cardiac pacemaker cells. So voltage-gated calcium channels, there are two important ones. One is the L-type calcium, L for a longer lasting uh, current, and the T is for the transient or the T-type calcium channel. 
the L-type calcium channels, you will come across them when you talk about the neuromuscular junction when we discuss the synapse. So, if this is the axon ending and this is the motor end plate, so this is the neuromuscular junction, L-type calcium channels are present in the axon ending. So, when the action potential reaches the axon ending, there is a depolarization. This depolarization opens the L-type calcium channel causing calcium to enter in and therefore, you have exocytosis. So, this is a major region in synaptic transmission as well as in the neuromuscular junction where L-type calcium channels help in the increase of intracellular calcium. The L-type calcium channel is also important in the ventricular action potential in the heart and this is important for the plateau phase. So, opening of this L-type calcium channels prolongs the action potential and generates a plateau of the action potential. So, this is an important uh, use of the L-type calcium channel in the, vent the cardiac ventricular action potential. You will learn more about this when you discuss the cardiac action potentials. The second place where we see the L-type calcium channel is in the depolarization of the pacemaker. So, the upstroke of the pacemaker potential is not due to sodium, but is due to calcium entry via the L-type calcium channels. So, the L-type cha calcium channels help in the action potential, they help in the plateau phase of the ventricular action potential and they also help in the depolarization of the pacemaker potential. The T-type calcium channel is important in the pre-potential of the cardiac pacemaker cells. Now, the cardiac pacemaker cell does not have a resting membrane potential, but when you study the action potential of the pacemaker cells, you will realize that there is a pre-potential and there are a few ion channels and transporters that are responsible for this. One of them is the T-type calcium channel. So, the T-type calcium channels are important for the pre-potential of the cardiac pacemaker cells. Now, what about the other calcium channels? Now, let us discuss a few other important calcium channels and one of them is the ryanodine receptor. Now, the ryanodine receptor is a receptor that is seen on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, in skeletal muscle cells, the endoplasmic reticulum is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum and this functions as a calcium store. And on this endoplasmic reticulum or sarcoplasmic reticulum, you have the ryanodine receptors. And it is through this receptor that calcium ions pass through. When we look at the ryanodine receptor, we find that it can open in two ways. It permits calcium exit from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but it opens either because of a change in voltage. So, it could either be a voltage induced opening or it could be a calcium induced opening. So, in skeletal muscles, the voltage that changes at the T-tubules is sensed by the ryanodine receptor via the DHPR receptor and this voltage causes calcium to uh, enter into the cytopl uh, cytoplasm. So, this is a voltage induced uh, calcium release. Whereas, in the cardiac muscle, it is a calcium induced uh, calcium release or calcium which enters the cytoplasm acts on the ryanodine receptor and causes this release of calcium. So, you have a voltage induced ca calcium release in skeletal muscle and a calcium induced calcium release in cardiac muscle. So, when we look at how we have classified the ryanodine receptor, these are calcium channels. You have ligand gated variants which are there in the cardiac muscle and you also have voltage induced variants which is RYR1 which is there in the skeletal muscle sarcoplasmic reticular membrane. We will now look at some of the other calcium channels and we will begin with the IP3 receptors. Now, this is important for non-excitable cells where these are also present on the sarcoplasmic reticulum and these permit calcium exit and they do that when the second messenger IP3 binds to this receptor. So, IP3 binding to the IP3 receptor causes a calcium release. Now, this is important for maintaining the calcium level in the intracellular fluid. The next type of channel we talk about is the, the store operated calcium channel. Now, this is present on the cell membrane and this is linked or this opens when there is a depletion of calcium within the in within the cytoplasmic stores or within the stores of calcium within the cell. So, when there is store depletion in the endoplasmic reticulum, this depletion is sensed by these channels and that opens these channels causing calcium entry from the outside. So, this is a store operated calcium channel.
Another type of calcium channel is very important for maintaining calcium homeostasis is the epithelial calcium channel. These are found in the kidney and uh, in the distal renal tubule and these are important for the uh, reabsorption of calcium in response to vitamin D. So, we have talked about the IP3 receptors, we have talked about the store operated calcium channels, we have talked about the epithelial calcium channels. So, with this we have covered the different calcium channels. We started off by discussing the voltage gated calcium channels that was the L and the T type. We then looked at the ryondine receptor and said there were ligand gated channels they could that was for calcium induced calcium release. We also talked about the ryonidine receptor in the skeletal muscle which is a voltage induced calcium release. We talked about the epithelial calcium channel which is vitamin D sensitive and helps in reabsorb, reabsorbing calcium in the distal renal tubule of the kidney and we also talked about the store operated calcium channel which opens with a depletion of calcium stores. We will now move on to the next type of ion channels and that is the non-specific monovalent cation channels and in particular we will be talking about the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, we will talk about the HCN channels and we will talk about a few other receptors in this category. What do we know about them? These are non-specific monovalent cation channels. So, they permit monovalent ions like sodium and potassium to enter through. Now, you can ask this question, if you permit sodium and potassium to pass through, which ion would pass through? Would it be sodium or would it be potassium? When you consider the equilibrium potentials for sodium and potassium, when these channels open near the RMP, the balance of the electrical and chemical gradients heavily favors sodium entry and this will be discussed when we talk about the equilibrium potentials. So, by and large these non-specific monovalent cation channels because of the electrochemical gradients of sodium and potassium and because these favor sodium, most of these near the RMP primarily permit sodium entry into the cell. The first one we will talk about is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, this was called so because the compound nicotine acts on these channels. So, that is how it gets the name and this is in contrast to the other type of acetylcholine receptor which is called the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, where do you see the nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptors? You see them in some certain synapses, you also see them in the neuromuscular junction and you will learn more about this when you discuss uh, the nervous system as well as when you study the skeletal muscle. But this permits primarily sodium entry and this is present on the end plate of the neuromuscular junction. So, when sodium enters it causes a small depolarization of the motor end plate which is called the end plate potential and that is sufficient to cause an action potential in the adjacent areas. So, the action of acetylcholine on this channel is terminated by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. So, this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is an example of a non-specific monovalent cation channel. We will move on to the next non-specific monovalent cation channel and that is what is called the HCN channel or which is sometimes uh, the current through this channel is sometimes discussed as or called the funny current. What do we know about them? HCN stands for hyperpolarization modulated cyclic nucleotide gated channel HCN. So, this opens with hyperpolarization. We have talked about voltage gated potassium channels, voltage gated sodium channels with which open with depolarization, but this is a channel that opens with hyperpolarization. They are non-specific monovalent cation channels. They could uh, permit sodium or potassium but it is primarily sodium that passes through and because this current appears with hyperpolarization it was deemed funny and therefore the name funny current. Now what is the important? This is important for the earliest depolarization of the pacemaker potential. We have discussed the pacemaker potential when we have talked about the T type calcium channel and the initial part of the depolarization of the prepotential or the pacemaker potential is because of the funny current. The next type of non-specific monovalent cation channels that we will discuss is the non-NMDA glutamate receptors. Now, we know that glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. 
So, if you look at the different neuro, uh, glutamate neurotransmitters, you could classify them as metabotropic receptors or ionotropic receptors. These ionotropic receptors are actually ion channels themselves. These can be classified into the NMDA receptors and the non-NMDA receptors. The non-NMDA receptors are non-specific monovalent cation channels, whereas the NMDA receptors are just non-specific cation channels. They also permit calcium. So, when we are talking about the non-specific monovalent cation channels, we will talk about the NMDA receptors, which are AMPA receptors and the kinate receptors. Now, this would be a good time to talk about the non-specific cation channels and the first one that we will discuss is the NMDA receptor. So, what do we know about the NMDA receptor? We know that it is a ligand gated, the ligand is glutamate and we know that it is a non-specific cation channel. It permits sodium, potassium and calcium entry into the cell. Now, the interesting thing about the NMDA glutamate receptors is that they are both voltage gated as well as ligand gated and they also require glycine binding for normal action. Interestingly, this channel is blocked by magnesium and for this magnesium to be displaced, we need to have an initial depolarization of the membrane. So, this is the NMDA glutamate receptor, which is an excite, where glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. We are talking about this as an example of a non-specific cation channel. Now, there are other non-specific cation channels, which are the TRP channels. Certain TRP channels, which are transient receptor potential channels, are also non-specific cation channels. And many of the mechanosensitive channels that help us sense mechanical changes, or, or mechanical stimuli are non-specific cation channels. We will discuss a little bit about the chloride channels. When you look at the different chloride channels, we will discuss the GABA and glycine receptors. GABA and glycine are both inhibitory neurotransmitters. There are also chloride channels which help regulate volume. Chloride channels which are implicated in cystic fibrosis, the CFTR channel. We have chloride channels which are voltage dependent chloride channels, but we will talk a little bit about the GABA as well as the glycine receptors. Both GABA and glycine are inhibitory neurotransmitters in the CNS. Certain GABA and glycine receptors are ligand gated chloride channels. So, when GABA or glycine binds to these channels, they open, permitting, so, uh, permitting chloride entry into the cell, thereby hyperpolarizing the cell. And this makes the cell membrane more difficult to depolarize. And so, these neurotransmitters act as inhibitory neurotransmitters, stabilizing the membrane or making it more difficult for the membrane to conduct an action potential. Okay. The next channel that we will be discussing is the voltage gated proton channel. Now, these are present in certain cells like the neutrophils. They help in the respiratory burst and they permit uh, the exit of protons from the cell. Interestingly, these are regulated by the pH gradient and they are voltage gated. So, these are both voltage gated as well as affected by the pH gradient across the cells. So, with this we complete the study of the various ion channels that you will commonly come across when you study physiology and we hope that as you come across these ion channels, you will be able to slot them into this simple classification and thereby understand what their selectivities are and what their gatings are. Thank you.